topic for today is about from rags to riches because the moment you learn about the father you are no longer a dirty rag you are no longer a wretched depraved wretch you are a son and a daughter you are you have become a child of god the moment you have a relationship through jesus christ and i want us to have that confidence at the end of this this uh, this this talk i want us to have that confidence that we can approach our heavenly father knowing that he is a good good father and he's never mad at us he's never angry at us and he wants to you to experience victory in your life through him and so the bible says in john chapter 1 verse 12 to 13 maybe lisa can read it it says but as many as received him that's jesus he gave the right to become children of god even to those who believe in his name who were born not of blood nor of the will of flesh nor the will of man but of god so what john is saying here is you know i believe john is someone he's 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 really really close to jesus you know he's the beloved disciple he's really he understands the heart of jesus he understands the love of god and what he's saying is, you know, Jesus came into this world and to those who received him, he gave the right to become children of God. So if we've received Jesus, we actually, the Bible says you have the right to become a child of God. You become a child of the king, a child of the most high God. So look at this. He gave the right to become a children of God. If you, there's a condition. The condition is if you receive Jesus. So we're going to unpack this. How do we become and how do we have that perspective that indeed, I am a child of God and as a child of God I have I have rights that God has given us if we receive yeah. Jesus. You know the Bible also says that you know he rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his beloved son. So when you accept what Jesus did on the cross, the fact that Jesus died on you, died for you on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin, you are actually rescued from the domain of darkness. You are transferred into the kingdom of God, the God most high, and you have all the rights as a child. You know, if we can think of adoption, if when a child is adopted, adopted, they are taken from their current position and they are placed in a family and as an adopted child they have all the rights of a child who was born into that family you know whatever belongs to the dad belongs to the kid they have all the rights they have all the right to call their their dad you know father their mother mother they have the right so that's us we were before we knew christ we were in the domain of darkness but then god brought us into his kingdom and when we enter his kingdom through the blood of jesus what he did for us based on what he did for us we have all the rights as a child of God. And if you can imagine, God owns everything. He is the God most high. He is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. So if you can just imagine what is, you know, what rights you have as that child of God and how much God loves you, that he was willing to adopt you and bring you completely into his family. You know, the problem is like what Lisa said, he has transferred us from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of beloved son. The problem is this, many believers still think that they are still in the domain of darkness. Many believers are still still think that they are you know they are limited by their circumstances, limited by by by, by their finances, limited by all these things, limited by their problems. As if God does not care about their their small problems or big problems. You know what? We have been transferred into the kingdom of His beloved Son, Son. and in the kingdom of God, you know, guess what? In the kingdom of God, is there lack in God's kingdom? Nope. Is there sickness in God's kingdom? Is there poverty in God's kingdom? Is there loneliness and depression in God's kingdom? You know, of course, the Bible is saying that it will culminate when we actually go to heaven. You know, that is the culmination of everything because we're still limited here on earth. But you know what? Our attitude is that it should be of the kingdom of God that no matter what we are facing right now, you know, our attitude, our sight is in heaven. Think we we the way we think is not the way we the world thinks. The way we think is should be the way a kingdom, a, a, a citizen of heaven should think. We should not be limited by our circumstances, knowing that you know, at the end of the day, heaven is our home and it starts in our spirit. You know, the Bible says, and it continued, John chapter 16, verse uh, John chapter 1, verse 16 to 80 says here, for in the fullness of Jesus. We have all received. Look at look at the, the tense here. 
We have all received. It is done. It is finished. We have all received and grace upon grace. What do you mean by grace upon grace? We have not only received one grace. Believers think that, you know, all Jesus did is just to give grace and that grace is just salvation. You know, that Jesus didn't care about your status here on earth that he only cares about your status, that it is in heaven. But you know what? Jesus gives grace upon grace. You know, when we get to heaven, we don't need that much grace anymore because we'll be in the presence of God. We need much grace while we are here on earth, when, especially when we are being persecuted, especially when we are being, uh, when we experience suffering, especially now that, you know, there's COVID, there's, there's this pandemic, and most of us are suffering because of it. Now is the time that we need much grace. And this is the condition of Paul when he was being buffeted and persecuted by the enemy, the thorn of the flesh that, that Paul experienced. What did God say to him? You know what, Paul? My grace is sufficient for you. That is what it means that when God gives us grace, the grace is, is, is sufficient for everything that we need. And the beautiful thing about this is that he gives us grace upon grace, upon grace, upon grace. You know, the difference between the grace that we receive from Jesus, from what many people have received from Moses. You know, through Moses, people received the law. And, but you know what? With, with Jesus, knowing that we cannot earn God's favor on our own, Jesus earned it for us. And because he earned it for us, whatever he earned, he deposited it in us through our spirit and through the Holy Spirit. And that is exactly the grace that God is giving. You didn't work for this, son. But you know what? I work for this. I died for this on the cross. And I'm giving it to you for free. That is grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. But grace and truth were realized through Jesus. We can never realize the grace through the law. We can never realize the full truth through the law. We can only realize it through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is at the bosom of the Father has explained Him. So Jesus here, His idea, His, his whole purpose in life is to explain how good God is. You know, he, he came to the earth. He came to earth as a man to explain, hey, my father is a loving father. My father is a good father. Your perspective of my father is really, really absolutely wrong. He's not angry at you. He's not mad at you. He wants to bring you home to come to him so that he can unleash his blessing, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, has been given to those whom he has chosen. You know, God loves us so much and he wants a relationship with each one of you. He wants you to enter his family and be his child. But he also knows that there, there is never anything that we could do to reach him. We could never be good enough. We could never earn our way to reach him. But yet he wants a relationship with you. So what he did was he came down. Jesus came down to show us who the father is because he wants us to know who God the father is. He says, if you have seen me, you've seen the father because God wants a relationship with you. He wants you to know him. He wants you to understand his heart. He wants you to understand his will. He wants you to understand his plans for you. And he wants you to declare his goodness to other people. And I love it here where it says, for of his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace, because grace is something given that we don't deserve. Grace is, you know, his divine power to do that which we cannot do on our own, but which he can help us do for his glory. And it's like for out of his fullness, it's kind of the idea. It's like he's so full and overflowing of grace that it just kind of overflows on us or overflows grace upon grace. So I just want all of us to understand whatever we go through in this life. Let's remember that if we've accepted Jesus, we are a child of the king. We belong to the kingdom of God. So these things that happen in this world, you know, there's a lot of things going on in this world that don't seem so good. But let's remember, wait, we belong to the kingdom. I'm a child of the king and this world is not my home. This is not my final place. I'm just here to proclaim the king, to proclaim the kingdom so other people will know him too. But whatever happens here, this is not my home. I have, you know, I have, I'm a child of the king. So I want us, all of us to have this idea that, and this understanding that 
who we are in Christ as a child of the King, so that we will not be so affected with the things that go on in this world. Because, you know, in this world, we will have trouble, but we can take heart because Jesus has overcome the world. So, you know, that's the reason why we are taking toil in really explaining the Father. Because, you know, in John chapter 1, that's what Jesus did. He, he came to explain who, who the Father is. And many of us have a really, you know, broken view and distorted view of the Father. Jesus explained to us what kind of a Father God the Father is. God the Father is a good and loving Father. This is a proof that God is a good Father. Look at this. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but the world might be saved through Him. Now, you know, if you're looking at this, and for some, some of you who are just new to the Bible, or this is the first time you hear the Bible, you may ask the question, how can a father send his only son to die for, you know, sinners like us? What kind of a father is that? But, you know, I'd like to encourage you, and I'd like to point out that Jesus was the one who volunteered. He said, you know what, Father? I know that, you know, men are hopeless. So send me. Send me to them and I will pay for the penalty of our sin. That's, that's what happened. And so the father, you know, even if it hurt him, even if, if it hurt him the most, the thing that he loves most, he had to sacrifice so that he can, he can save us from our sins. That gives us a picture how loving not only the father but the son and how, 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 how uh, you know, they are together in loving us and in saving us. That's their plan for us all. And so if he can give us the son to save us from our sins, then, you know, that, that's, that's the measure. I, I don't think there's any higher measure of, 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 of how love, lo of love than, than the father and the son, you know, going through that sacrifice so that we can experience eternal life. You know, the eternal life, as we have mentioned last week, is this. And Jesus defined it in John 17, 3. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus whom you have sent. So God is saying, Jesus is saying, you know what? Eternal life is starts when they know you, Father. Eternal life starts when I, you know, they, they believe in me and they believe that you sent me. Eternal life starts when they start appreciating you, Father, for who you are. Eternal life starts when they have a relationship with you, Father, because Apart from a relationship with you, there's no life. But when people have a relationship with you, Father, that's the start of eternal life. And for many people, they didn't realize that eternal life starts not in heaven. It starts here on earth. The moment you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, eternal life happens. The moment you receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you become a child of God. You have been transferred from the domain of darkness into his kingdom. You become a kingdom what? a citizen of, 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 of uh, the kingdom of God. You become his child. And because you are his child, you have certain privileges. And you also have certain responsibilities. But, you know, you have, you have this uh, inheritance that God has prepared for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. You know what? The meaning of perish is they will not be destroyed. God is not wanting you to experience destruction. God doesn't want you to be destroyed. Your health to be destroyed, your mental condition to be destroyed, your families, your families to be destroyed, your relationship with your wife to be destroyed. God doesn't want any of that. But you know what? There is a destruction that will be for a lifetime. And that destruction is in hell. But God sent his son so that we can be taken out from an eternal damnation of hell so that we can have eternal life in him. And so how do we start appreciating these uh, things, uh, how good our father is? How do we, where do we start? Because many people are, you know, they, they have hangups, they have they yes. have they have hurts in the past. Disappointment. They have disappointment, and their mind was set in the circumstances they're in. Maybe some of you are living a, a single life, like you're 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 still you're still wanting to you know you've dream of having a, a relationship with a 
with a husband or a relationship with a wife, but you're getting older. But you know what? And you feel like your world is, is so constrained. I want to encourage you that once you have Jesus in your life, your life is complete. You are complete in Christ. And the way to, the way to change your mind, the way to change your attitude and your perspective of things, you know what? The way to do it is to renew your mind. And that is the reason why the Bible says in Romans 12 too, do not be conformed to this world. You know, this world will make you feel hopeless. This world will make you feel lonely. This world will push you to depression. Yeah. Because what? The world is all about comparison. You know, this world would like you to, it's all about competition. It's all about having more of material things. It's about being more famous. It's about having more likes or having more followers more money. or having more money or having more attention or whatever it is. But you know what? The Bible is saying, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We have to renew our mind so that we may prove what the will of God is, which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Do you want to experience all that is good? Yes or no? Can you raise your hand? If you are that person, digital hand. I mean, if even if I cannot see you online, uh, I want you to just you know raise your hand. If you are, I thank you. Thank you for for those people who are raising their hand. If you want to experience what is good, who among you wants to experience what is acceptable? Who among you wants to experience what is perfect? You know what? If you want to experience this, I would like to encourage you that God wants you to experience this. You experience this by aligning your will to His will so that you may prove what the will of God is. The will of God is good, the will of God is acceptable. The will of God is perfect. Let me ask you a question. I'll just pause and then uh, jump a little bit from, from our topic and just ask you a question. Do you think sickness is good? Do you think sickness is perfect for you? Do you think sickness is God's will for you? Well, nobody wants to get sick. God doesn't want you to get sick. And later on, we will, we will talk about, we will even talk about, you know, in the Bible, it says that in, I'll talk about it now. In Isaiah chapter 53, that he, Jesus, did not only die on the cross to save us from our sins, but by his wounds, we, are, we were healed. We are healed. In Isaiah 53, and in 1 Peter chapter 2, we were healed. God has placed all pain, all sorrow, all suffering upon Jesus because he doesn't want his kids to suffer. Yeah, because the reality is that the way the world is, you know, sometimes it can be discouraging when we look at the world, the way the world is, the way the world thinks, because there's just so much fear and there's so much destruction because the reality is that we live in a fallen world that has is being destroyed by sin, has been destroyed and is being destroyed by sin. So if we only keep our eyes on the world, that's where fear comes in. That's where discouragement comes in. That's where defeat and depression comes in. If we only have our eyes on this world, but we want to encourage you that if you are a child of God, you do not have to have your eyes on this world. You can lift your eyes onto God and lift your eyes onto things above because you are now a child of the King. Good, acceptable, and perfect. That is the Father's will. I just want you to have a mental picture and save this, you know, and, and we're going to go back to this, that God's will is good, acceptable, and perfect. Therefore, whatever is evil, whatever is unacceptable, and whatever is imperfect, that's not God's will for you. Because God's will is good, acceptable, and perfect. And God's will is to bring you from rags to riches. He doesn't want you to stay in the mire. He doesn't want you to stay depressed. He doesn't want you to stay sick. He doesn't want you to stay poor. God wants to bring you from the domain of darkness into the realm of his beloved son. So we're going to go now. We're going to talk about who God the Father is. But I want all of us to have in our mind right now that, you know, God's will for us is good, acceptable, and perfect. And God's will for our family is good, acceptable, and perfect. And really the key is, to having a family that looks like that, good, acceptable, and perfect, is when we know God the Father and when our family members go know God the Father. So our prayer is today that we will understand God the Father and that we will be able to share because really that is the hope. No family is too broken that God cannot 
redeem and God cannot, God cannot fix and God cannot restore. But the only hope is understanding what Jesus did on the cross and understanding who God is as your father. So because of the limitation of people, people couldn't understand his will. What Jesus did was he, he, he came up with parables. Parables are heavenly truths. Heavenly truths that people couldn't comprehend. And so Jesus made it super simple. Simple story. Simple story so that they can understand the will of the Father. And one of my favorite parables is in Luke chapter 15, verse 11 to 32. And most of you probably are aware of this parable. This is the parable. Most people call this the prodigal child or the prodigal son. But I would like to, you know, if I can rename this. In your Bible, I will call it the good, good father, the loving father, because the focus is not the son. The focus is how God, how good God is. And many people, you know, when they read this parable, they focus on the pig pen experience. How many of you have heard the pig pen experience? And many people, you know, they would like to point out every time you're suffering or every time you're going through problems or trials, oh, you, you will hear them say, you know, oh, you're going through a pig pen experience. God is allowing you. God has let you into the pig pen experience so that he can teach you something. Well, today we're going to talk about this and we're going to see if that is true. We're going to see if it is really true that God, was it God who really brought the son, his younger son through the pig pen experience? Or was it the decision, the wrong decision of the son? So we're going to go through that. Let me read the parable. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want to share, I want my share of my estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. You know po, sa Tagalog, if you're Filipino and you're listening to us, sa Tagalog, itong anak na nakababata, itong bunsong anak na lalaki, ang sabi niya doon sa tatay niya, Tay, pwede ba, Erpat, pwede ba yung aking uh, inheritance? May inheritance sa Tagalog. Why am I asking you? You're, you're white. Mana. Mana, there you go. Thank yung you. mana ko. Yung mana ko, can I have it? Pwede ko bang makuha na yung mana ko? You know, even in our modern age right now, you know, there's no way you can go to your father and ask for your mana. That is absolutely this. It's uh, rude. It's rude. Especially disrespectful. Before, yeah. And you're, if, if it happened before, the father can even ask the whole neighbors, you know, the whole, the whole town to, to, to kill you. To, to stone you. And that is the kind of culture they had before. Of course, it's not like this now. How about you, Nick? Go ahead. To add to the before part, this is Middle Eastern mm-hmm. culture. This is like, you don't cross that line. It, yeah. It, how about, if I ask you, Nick, you know, if if uh, uncle, if you ask your mana from uncle, do you think he will appreciate it? My dad's weird. He handed it to me at an early age. Well, because of <laughs> reverse. Question. He so so it's actually no 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 I'll, I'll I'll teach on that but yeah that did it differently. Yes, but during this time in that culture, when he's asking already for the inheritance, it's kind of like he's saying, you know, Dad, you might as well be dead to me. Yeah. That was kind of the the what the was meaning. coming, the meaning of that. So it was really a, a rude thing for him to say in that culture of that time. So I don't want to do anything with you. I just want your money. Basically, that's what he's saying. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings. See, after getting his inheritance, his, his idea or his plan was to really move out of the house. Gusto niya talaga lumayas at waldasin yung pera ng kanyang tatay. After a few days later, his younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. You know, you know people who don't like you, they will just go as far okay. away from you. We've, actually, we've known people like that. Like they, they don't want to do anything with you. They, they'll just move as far as they can from you. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. So winaldas niya talaga lahat ng kanyang pera uh, sa, sa party and, 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 and with, with girls and, and doing all these things that are evil in the sight of his father. And the reason why he got all the money and went away so that nobody can tell him what to do so that he can just enjoy without 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 people telling him what to do basically that's now if you have a son like this what do you think you will do with your kid <laughs> if you have a son like this you know what i don't know i, I honestly i don't know I, i've trained my kids so that they will not be like this all right so i don't know what i'm going to do with my kid 
but for sure it would hurt <laughs> the father. Hurt. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land. So timing naman. And he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. You know, in the culture of uh, of the Israelites, they, you know, this is the lowest of the low. This is the worst job that you can ever have. Because pigs were considered a dirty animal. So to be there feeding the pigs is like the lowest of the low that you can go. And the young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. So natakam siya. You know, he was so hungry na natakam siya doon sa food nung pig, sa kaning baboy. I don't know if you're familiar with kaning baboy. Right now, you know, in the villages before, uh, in the barrio, actually even in Manila before, we used to have a tin can that we will hang outside the house. And all the refuse and all the, what do you call that? All the, the, the scraps of uh, food, yung tira-tira. We'll just put them all together there. And it's going to be smelly because it's um, it's panis. You know, it's it's foul smelling and it's already, it's already uh, what do you call it? Uh, rotting. Rotting. But then, you know, pe- th- there would be a person who would be uh, collecting all these so that he can feed it to the pigs. And this is what it looks like. This are this is the food that is being given to the pigs. And when the son saw it, he said, "You know what? Mm, that tastes that looks good." Well, he was so desperate. He, he was he was so desperate. But no one gave him even that. No one gave him nothing. It was just the land is just so uh, so oh, wasa. So the famine swept the land that no one could give him anything. And so he was desperate. And this is what many people call pig pen experience. Now, let me ask you a question. Did the father, does the father wanted him to go to that, you know, was it the father who brought him to that pig pen experience? Oh, tara, tara, anak, alika, 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 iwan kita dito, lumayas ka sa bahay ko. Dito ka sa, you know, lumayas ka, magpaka, magpakalayo-layo ka sa akin. And then, eto, eto, etong baboy yan, mukha kang baboy, isa kang baboy na anak, dyan ka. Is that, is that, Did he experience this from the father? Or was this his own choice? Was this a result of the consequence of his own uh, bad choices, of his own sin? So clearly, we can see this is a result of his own sin. Now, let's look at what happened. When he finally came to his senses, boom, he came to his senses. At home, and he was dreaming about, his, uh, he was missing his own. He was missing his father. He was missing his, you know, what he enjoyed before. At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. Yung mga kasama namin sa bahay, yung mga, uh, yung mga servants namin, meron silang pagkain and they have even food to spare. Whenever they eat, there's something that is, uh, you know, there, there's, there's, there's left over. And here I am dying of hunger. So he's seeing their condition And and he's comparing his condition. So 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 he's 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 processing this, processing this. And then he said, "I will go home to my father." Immediately he thought, "You know what? I'm I'm gonna make a decision. I'm gonna go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both both heaven and earth and you. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on and hire me as a servant.' You know what? What do you think is the son's?" Uh, Uh, motivation here was the son motivated by his love for the father was the son motivated by his good deeds was the son really truly repentant no he was re- he, he he was motivated by his hunger he the reason why he thought of the father because he was suffering And he realized his father's house was a house of abundance. And here he was living in lack and despair. But his father had so much abundance that even the even the servants had enough to spare over and above. So somehow deep in his mind, he knows how good his father is. That, that he will not be denied as a servant. But somehow, okay, I want you to, to see this. You know, he has a, he has a view of a father That is, uh, if, if the father's, uh, what do you call it, attitude and character is really 100%, really awesome, right? Really awesome. This is his view of his father, really here. But even at that moment, he knows that the father is good enough to feed him. He knows that the father is good enough to accept him as a servant. 
So his view of a father, his knowledge of a father, what was revealed to him by his own you know, uh, perspective or own uh, thinking is just up to here. But the father later on will see how much good the father is, his standard. But his standard is just here. So he said, you know, I'm going to go back to my father and just ask for mercy. So the younger son asked for mercy. I want you to say this word without unmuting. Just say this word with me, mercy. Ask for mercy. Many believers always ask God for mercy. Is it bad? No. It is good. I'm not saying it is bad. But it is just up here. When you ask God for mercy, Lord, have mercy. Heal me from my sickness. It's just your knowledge of a father is just here. It's not here. Just here. I will give you an example. You know, of course, this example is nothing, nothing like, like the, the parable. But there was one time. Uh, we had, a, you know, I bought Pringles in the house. And uh, this, I put the Pringle in, uh, you know, the box of snacks in our, in our cupboard. cupboard. Uh, what's covered in, in our cabinet. So in the kitchen, cabinet. And my son went to me and said, Hey, daddy, is the, is the, you know, yung Pringles na nandu sa cabinet, sa ba yun? Is that yours, daddy? And I said, and he said, you know, can I have, can I have one? Can I have some? Can I open it? And can I have some? And on one hand, I felt like, you know, I was really honored that my son knows how to, how to ask permission. Because my two girls will just get it. You know, it's the, they, they, they won't ask for it. They, they're going to finish it. You know, if you have like 10 Pringles in the house or 10 chocolate bars, they're going to finish it. Like, like it's going to be gone. And, and that's why the reason why I allocate it. Sometimes I hide it from them, you know, because otherwise they're going to finish it. But then my son approached me. I said, Daddy, can I, can I have the Pringle? On one hand, I respect him. On the other hand, I felt bad for him. I felt bad that, you know, he had to ask permission from me. And so I told my son, you know what, Yeshua, I know that you are a responsible kuya. And you are a responsible son that you will not eat beyond what you need. And because of that, son, you know what, whatever I own, you own. Whatever I have, you have. Eat whatever you want. If, and if, it, is the, if it is not enough, you just tell daddy, I'm going to buy it for you. You know, because I know, I know your heart. And so I felt bad that my son, my son's view of me is just here. But what I'm willing to give him is up to here and even beyond. You know what? That's how we view our God the Father. We view our God the Father as just only giving this and we have to beg for mercy. That we have to do something to earn his favor. That we have to, we have to make him proud. That we have to we have to earn everything. That is that everything that we do with him is transactional. I give you this, Father. You give me this. I serve you this much. You give me this. I I, I sign up for this ministry, for that ministry, for this ministry. And I, you know, from Monday to Sunday, I will I will I will attend all the Bible study so that I can earn your favor. And when when you feel like your prayers are not answered, you go back to God and you say. I've been doing this and this and this and this. How come you have not given me what I wanted? And so that is because, you know, your relationship with God is just here. Your relationship is transactional. You, you view God as somebody that you would love you if you do something for him. But let's look. So the younger son is asking for mercy. I, I, just, wanted, I just want you to, to, to have an appreciation that his, his view of God is just up to here his instead father. of this. Yeah. Of his father. All right. So look at that. Ask for mercy. So he returned to his father. And while he was still a long way off. Can you say long way off? His father saw him coming. What do you mean by this? You know, the father. Remember, the, the father is a taipan. You know, the father is a billionaire. And the father probably has tons and tons, hectares and hectares of, of land. And you know, during that time, when, when, they, when, when there's a really rich man, they would have servants. The servants will be outside the house doing all the outside work. And the owner of the house, especially an old man, will just be inside and just wait for if there's any visitor. He's not going to face the visitor himself. 
a servant will tell him that, hey, boss, meron, meron kang bisita. Would you want to see him? And so everything is filtered by the bodyguards, by the servants, etc. Right? So look at this. While the boy was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Why do you think the father saw him coming? I believe the reason why the father saw him coming is because the father has been looking for the son. He's been waiting. He's been waiting and waiting and waiting. He, the father knew the place or the direction where the, the, the son went out. And so the father went there halfway so that when the son comes back, what would the father do? Let's read. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son. I will pause there. You know what? Middle Eastern culture, old men don't run. They they just don't run. You it's know, not dignified. It's not dignified. It's not dignified uh, uh, to run. The you clothes know, the, that they wear. Yeah, of course. The, the clothes that they wear. It's 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 with robe. It, it's hard. To, it's hard to run. It, it's undignified to run. Number two, since the son made the mockery of the dad in the family. All the neighbors would have known, hey, what are you doing looking for your son who just you know disgraced you, you? Who shamed you? This is this is their, their family was disgraced because of this son, but the father didn't didn't care. You know what? I want to see my son. I'm I, I miss my son. I'm gonna go check him out. Yeah, yes, Nick. I'd add that the son worked at the pig pen. So yeah. most likely the son would be covered in pig dung. Mm-hmm. He he's he's considered unclean in Jewish customs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in Jewish custom, yes, thank you, Nick. The religious leaders, when they are hearing this, you know, oh, they, he, the son worked for the pig. Oh, that is that is absolutely he's dirty. Dirty. He's unclean. He's unclean. But you know what? The father, what he did, he ran to his son and embraced him and kissed him. Let me ask you a question: Has the son done anything yet? Has he said sorry yet? Has he has he asked for forgiveness? Did he did he did he go on his on his uh knee to beg? Not yet. Was not, he worthy? Was he worthy? No, he's not even clean, religiously, uh, ceremoniously unclean. But the father embraced him and kissed him, even if he did not deserve it. And now the son said, Okay, all right, now I know. Now I know that my dad is a little bit open. You know what? He said to his dad, father. I have seen both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. You know, let me just give you a story. Uh, in college, I, I did so many bad things. Like, like really, I went to drugs, uh, girls, uh, a lot of things. Drinking, smoking, behind my dad. And there was one time I disrespected my mom. And that was just, that was just, uh, I was really, really, uh, really off. And then I, 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 you know, my mom got mad at me and I decided I'm going to run away. And so I packed all my things in, in, in my car. It's not even my car. It's my dad's car. Mm-hmm. I packed my things all in there and I forgot some things in my, in, my, in my room. And so I went back in the house and I was trying to avoid my dad because my dad is almost six foot tall. And he, he's, he's, uh, he's. You know, his uh, knuckle is really, you know, almost twice as big as mine. He's really a strong, strong man. Even now at 70, he can still play basketball. He can still do pull-ups. And he's really a, a strong man. And, and I felt like, you know, and he's a very, very disciplinarian. You know, I grew up being disciplined by my dad. And at that moment, I saw my dad at the door. I was like, oh, no. I'm like, oh, no. And he saw me bringing out all my stuff. And I need to get something. And at the door, when I was about to pass, you know what my dad did? My dad, my dad just opened his arms and embraced me. And he didn't say anything. He just embraced me. And after, after embracing me for a while, he said, you know what? Anna, I want you to stay. I love you. I want you to stay. And uh, he said, I'm going to take care of mommy. Uh, but I want you to stay. And that moment, I felt like I don't deserve this. I really don't deserve such attention. And you know what? That is a picture of what the father did to the son. He didn't deserve it. He deserved to be be taken out. He deserved to be broken. He deserved to stay in that pig pen experience. But you know what? In the presence of his father, there's no more pig pen experience. 
what Lisa was saying from, from the dominion of darkness was transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. That is what happened to this young man. He was transferred into the property of the father. In my property, you will enjoy everything that I have. So the son said to the father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy being called your son. Lisa wants to say yeah. something. That's why the Bible says that it's the kindness of God that brings us to repentance. And we can see here in this story that Jesus told, it was the kindness of the father that brought the son to repentance. And that's the same way it is with God the father. It's his kindness that brings us to repentance. So I just want to encourage you all that I feel like there's some people here who are praying for a family member to know God the Father. And I just want to encourage you, pray that they understand the kindness of God. Because when they understand the kindness of God, that will bring them to repentance. And again, the only hope for our family, the only hope for people changing is when they come to God. So pray that they understand the kindness of God. And that will bring them to repentance. And that will change them and bring them into a relationship with God the Father. You know, I will I will just give you that, that uh, verse. Uh, it is the kindness of God that brings us to repentance. It is in Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. The kindness of God that brings us to repentance. Very, 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 very important verse so that we will understand His goodness. Yeah, because sometimes we think it's, you know, it's a... The spanking of God that brings us to repentance. So we think, well, maybe, you know, if I have a family member that's not who who's not following God, maybe if I have a family member that's doing the wrong thing, I should I should pray that they'll, you know, be spanked by God, so to speak. But the Bible says it's the kindness of God that brings us to repentance. So it's when we understood the kindness of God that we came to know God, the father. So pray the same thing for your family members, the people you're praying for, pray that they understand mm. the kindness of God and that will bring them to repentance and that will bring them into a relationship with God. And that will be what will restore your family. Or do you think lightly of the riches and kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God, is what brings us to repentance. Yes, Nick? Um, the son. Initially, before he went back, he even mentioned that he he, he was okay to become one of the hired servants. Uh, okay. I think that's in a... No longer Here. worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. That was verse 19. Yeah. But by the time that he went back to the father... He goes, Father, I have sinned against heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But before, I don't know whether or not he stopped himself from, from, from mentioning wanting to become a servant. But the father stopped him and asked his servants to serve the son right away. Um, I've, I've, we've had this conversation before wherein I kind of don't dislike Believers, Christians who use this as the, see, uh, God allowed him or it's the pig pen experience and this and that. Or the sometimes, you know, God statement. Sometimes God, God is not the God of sometimes. Look at the abundance of the Father. The abundance of the Father. And and it it suits the the. the the vine one, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. It's like by the time the son was near the father, fruits just, just starts to, to pour towards his direction. Amen. Awesome. The father knew that without him, the son could not do nothing. And so what did the father do? But his father said to the servants, quick. He did not want to delay. He didn't say to the son, okay, son, have you learned your lesson already? Maybe you have not learned your lesson yet. Maybe I should let you experience more pig pen experience. He did not say that. Absolutely. He said, quick, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Bring the finest robe. In the house, and you know, in, in in their culture, when you have a robe, you're like you're like uh, really rich. You remember you remember uh, uh, the robe of uh, what do you call this? Uh, Joseph. Joseph. That's the finest robe. It, 
quick, bring the finest robe in the house. And when you have the finest robe in the house, it is, it is set apart. That's what it means. The finest robe is set apart for a fine gathering, for a special occasion. Bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring on his, uh, for his finger. And the ring represents authority. So the father has put, again, that authority, uh, you know, place of authority to the son. So whenever the servants see and their relatives see and their neighbors see that ring was on the son of the finger, on the son of the finger, on the finger of the son. And that means that, you know, he's back. You know, uh, he, he's back into his position. Everything that was authority. He's back in his authority. So, and then he said sandals for his feet. So the robe in the house, Armani robe. And then Bulgari ring. And then, I don't know, sandals. I don't know what kind of sandals. Uh, maybe a uh, uh, Ferragamo sandals. I don't know. <laughs> so everything that the father has, I said, you know what? It's yours. Yeah. You know what? I, I'm saving all these things for you. You thought that you, you know, the, the son spent everything. He wasted all his inheritance, but the father just has so, so much more. He, he just has so much more robe, he has so much more ring, and he has so much more sandals that it's, not, it's just overflowing. And, and he wanted the son to experience, you know what, son? Once you're in my home, once you're in my presence, once you're in my kingdom, you don't have to get out of the house and be cold. You don't have to get out of the house and be without authority. And so the demons can just attack you whenever they know you have authority, son. And you don't have to go out of the house without a sandal and, and, and your feet become, you know, it's going to be hurt by, 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 by the heat from the, from the road. No, I, I don't want that. I don't want thorns from you. That, that's nothing. I, I want to protect you from the top of your head to the sole of your feet. You are protected and you have been blessed. So really what the father is doing is he's reinstating the son as his son, as part of the household. And I just want us to appreciate that's what God the father does for us. You know, maybe some of us have been in that pig pen experience. Maybe, you know, we, we've been living away from the father. But when the son came home, the father immediately welcomed him. The father immediately reinstated him. You know, the father immediately clothed him. You know, the son was dirty. The son was unclean, but he put that role of him on him to clean him so even if we are broken even if we consider ourselves dirty and if we've gone through misery maybe even misery that we brought upon ourselves or that other people brought upon us we want to encourage you go to the father you know even if you feel you're too dirty you're never too dirty to go to the father go to the father he will be the one to make you whole he will be the one to save you he will be the one to instate you as a son or a daughter and he will be the one to to clothe you to cover you to clean you up he will be the one to make you whole i just want you to experience um, the love of the father if you are this if you can relate to the younger son you know what all the father is wanting you to do is you know come back to him yeah. come back to him come back to him i would like to point out also that it is not God the Father who allows us to go through the pig pen experience. He doesn't want it for you. In fact, he doesn't own, he doesn't own pigs. Do you know that the Father doesn't own pigs? What does he own? He, you know, in this, in this Jewish culture, they don't, they don't own pigs. They, uh, pigs are dirty for them. They, they, they don't want to do anything with pigs. Why would the loving Father give his son, who's utterly broken already by the world, who's utterly broken by their wrong choices, put more guilt and put more shame by letting them stay in the pig pen experience. You know what You know what the father has? He doesn't have a pig. You know what he has? He has a calf. And that calf, he's been fattening. Steak. Steak. I'm not going to give you pork chop. I'm going to give you steak. You know, this is kill the calf that we have been fattening. You know what he did? He called andox. 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 Lechon baka. And he ordered it and said, you know what? <laughs> he ordered it and said, you know, I've been fattening this. I, I don't think it's in dogs. I, uh, what's that? What's your favorite steakhouse, Nick? Wolfgang? Or what, what's that? Uh, crew is one of them also. Crew. So, you know, the father didn't only order 
and had it delivered. He he killed the whole calf. Do you think the son can eat the whole calf? Maybe he's hungry, but no, no. He the whole, the calf is for celebrating, and you will see here. We must celebrate with a feast. What do you mean by a celebration with a feast? He wants to make everybody known. He wants to announce it to the whole world. He wants to announce it to the servants. He wants to announce it to the neighbors. That you know what? I'm proud of my son coming back to me. Not because of what he did, but because of, you know, I'm just a loving dad. I'm proud for him to come back to me. I'm, I'm happy that he's here. And you know what the Bible says? That whenever somebody would, would repent, and somebody would go back to God and believe in Jesus. Do you know that there's a feast in heaven? That there will be angels celebrating? That's, that's what the Bible says. That there is, a, there, there is this celebration and a feast in heaven. Whenever one sinner comes back to God. And I believe that when we go to heaven, we will see fat, fat angels. Fat angels. Why, why, why are these so, angels so fat? Because, because of the people who accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. God is just having feast and feast and feast for his angels. That, that's what the Bible says. No, the Bible didn't say that angels are fat. We must celebrate a feast for the son of mine was dead. And now he has returned to life. He was lost, but now he was found. Now, let, this is very, very important. I don't want you to miss it. For other people, for the neighbors... They view the son as dead, good as dead. But as far as the father is concerned, no, I'm going to give him life. I'm going to give him back what he has left. Just waiting for him to come back. I, I'm just waiting for him to come back. You know, I'm going to give him life and he will experience life abundant. The enemy comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came so that we may have life and have it in abundance. And then he said, he was lost. Everybody thought, ah, his lost. He's not coming back anymore. Wala nang pag-asa yan. Has any one of your neighbors or, or your uh, friends or even your relatives or even your parents said, you know what, wala ka nang pag-asa. Wala ka nang pag-asa. Have you ever heard that? Napaka-bobo mo. Napaka-pangit mo. Wala kang kapag-pag-asa. Hindi ka marunong sa negosyo. Y- yung, yung marriage mo ay nawasak dahil sa'yo. You know, have you heard that from people? But you know what? The, God is saying, you know what? I can find you. I, in fact, I've found you. The fact that you are listening right now, I believe that the Father is calling you home. Amen. And you know how the Father calls us home? Through His Word. Come home. The Father is saying, you know what? I know that you are in that mire right now. I know that you are utterly broken by your sin. I know that you are utterly broken by the negative words that you've heard from people. But you know what? I want you to come home. And when you come home, I'll be running towards you. I'll be hugging you. And you will be reinstated. Because I have found you. And so the party began. Mm. My goodness. I don't know if you feel it, but I feel the heart of the Father here. The Son was just asking for mercy. He was begging for mercy. But you know what? God extended grace. The son's expectation of the father is just up to here. But the father's love is up to here. You know, as far as the east is from the west, the Bible says, so far I have taken out your sin. I have removed your sin from you and from me. There's no, there's no I have forgotten it. I, you are no longer sin, sinner. And that is grace. Mm-hmm. That is grace. So there is no one that is too lost that you are beyond hope. So if, you know, if that's you, if you feel like, you know, I'm just so lost, I'm just so broken. I've made so many mistakes. I'm so dirty. We just want to encourage you go to the father, go to the father. He's waiting for you with his open arms. He's just waiting for you to come home. And we want to encourage you also, if there's a family member that you felt was beyond hope, there's no one that's beyond hope. God, you know, anyone who comes to the Father, God will never turn away. He will just be waiting with his arms wide open. So just pray for that person to come to the Father. He extended grace. The, son, the younger son was asking for mercy. The Father extended grace. I just want you to say that. The Father extended grace. The son, the younger son was asking for mercy. Now, let's look at the older brother. Oh, the older son. 
Lisa, you want to read this? Okay. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of his servants, what was going on? Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. Now, the older brother was angry and he wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied. So this was the reply of the older son. All these years I have slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me even one goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. So do you think the older brother has the right to say this? Do you think he was, he was, he was, has the right? I believe he does. I believe he does. I believe that, you know, he's, he's the older brother. He's the responsible one. And yet, you know, he it, it is within his right to say this. Yes, all he right. feels like, you know what, I've been doing the right thing all along. And I feel like this brother of mine just doesn't deserve this party. I deserve this party. I've been, why, I've been trying to do the right thing. I've been working hard. This other person, my brother, has been squandering. He just doesn't deserve it. So I don't know, like, for, for most people, I believe most people can have can um, relate to the younger son, but a lot of people can relate to the older son. They feel like, you know what, I've been trying to do the right thing. I've been trying to work. And I feel like I just deserve more. I deserve better. You know, I, I can relate to both because I'm the only son. <laughs> so, Nick, go ahead. Can I, I'll, I'll add to that. Your version's the mild version. Uh, in King James, he actually said like low in, in, in some some versions he actually talked to his dad by saying like look <laughs> right like look yeah. these are, many years that was the tone it, are you blind it, yeah like look like dad <laughs> right look yeah <laughs> you, you know the reason these why many years mm -hmm. yeah you know the reason why because he's trying to earn favor so his relationship with his father is also this much. Transactional. It's transactional. He's trying to look for favor. It's transactional. Let's look at this. The younger, the older son was crying for justice. Again, the younger son asked for mercy. The older son was crying for justice. And through this story, I realized justice mercy and grace was defined and grace was shown by the father and this is what i realized like the older brother you know what it is impossible to enjoy what god has given you when you always look at the at what god is giving to someone else you know what he, he has so much to give god has so much to give so if you feel like it's unfair that god is treating somebody good you know, don't ever think that way because God is a God of justice. God is always fair. And I believe this son, he didn't understand the heart of the father. And I think many people live this way also. We feel like our relationship with God the Father is transactional. We feel like, okay, God, I've done this, so I deserve you, God, to do this for me. I deserve this blessing because I've done this. I've worked hard. I've tried to do the right thing. So it's, again, effort based based on our effort and what we did but what the son failed to realize that because he was a son he enjoyed everything of the father mm -hmm. and sometimes like this says we're so busy comparing our life with other people's lives we feel like oh, i've done the right thing i deserve blessing how come that person yeah. didn't do the same right thing that me i'm doing but they're getting blessed that's not fair so we just get so frustrated when we we look at other people's lives but we need to realize who we are as a child and we need to realize that in the kingdom of god there is no lack just because God is blessing one person doesn't mean that he'll withhold blessings from us. There is no lack in God's kingdom. Just because our father is generous in giving grace to others, it doesn't mean there's less grace for us. God's love has no limit and there is no scarcity in the kingdom of God. You know, I, I realize, you know, for many believers, there's scarcity mentality. We are looking at other people's blessings instead of realizing what God has given us. And because of this, we think that God is unfair. We think that we have to earn God's favor. And many believers, this is how they view God's blessing. I'm going to do this so that I will be blessed. I want you to change that perspective. 
I want, and this is, you know, this is radical. I, I'm telling you guys, it's radical. Instead of thinking that I'm going to do this so that I will be blessed. Think of this this way. I am blessed by God, by a good God, a loving God. That's the reason I am doing this good works. Isn't that more out of a relationship instead of transactional? Transactional kind of relationship is this. I'm going to do all these good things so that I will be blessed. While a relationship of love is like this. I'm already be blessed by God. Because I understand who I am as a child of God. I understand my position Because as his child. I understand that Jesus has already given himself up for me. How much more will he not give us all things? I've, it's written in the Bible. The promise has been set. The Bible is done. It is, finished. It, is, it is said already. It is written. Therefore, I am blessed. And since I am already blessed, I will respond in love to God. And this is what the Bible is saying. It is not that we love God, but it is God loved us first. So he first loved us. The only things that we can do is not on our own self-effort, but it is through the grace that God enabled us to love him back. And so we are, most of us are like the older brother. We go to God and demand from God things because of what we did. We don't have to demand God from God. God has given it freely. You don't have to demand it. It is free. Let me tell you. Let me convince you that what I'm saying is true. Look at this. The father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to earn it. It's yours. We had to celebrate this happening. All you have to do is just, you know, take it. Take it, son. It's yours. We have to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and now has come back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. Now, let's look at this too. The young son was seeking for mercy. He knew he didn't deserve to be accepted, that he was begging for food and shelter. He was looking forward to become just one of the servants, but the father extended grace. You know what? And the older son was asking for justice. Instead of being rebuked by the father harshly, the father could have said, oh, tumigil ka nga dyan. Tumigil ka nga dyan. No, he said, you know what? Everything I have is yours. So what is better than justice? What is better than mercy? Grace. And that is, we are at the age of grace. God is not judging you. The Bible says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And so judgment, don't get me wrong, there will be a time of judgment, but that is not yet. Not yet. The time of judgment will come when Jesus comes back. He will have the, the, the Bema end. judgment, the white, white throne judgment, and he will judge Uh, men based on whether or not they have a relationship with God through Jesus. And based on if you have a relationship with Jesus, he will judge you based on what you have done for the kingdom. And you will have that judgment will just earn you what? Crown. But you don't have to do anything to go to heaven except for to believe in Jesus. You know, God's grace is never transactional. God's grace is always relational. Go Nick. Okay. One, you used up the verses that I was planning to use next week, but no <laughs> worries. I'll find another uh, angle to it because uh, next week we will discuss from rules to relationships. The, the prodigal son angle has always been used as sometimes God, again, that God would allow, that it's a big pen experience. Yeah. God is constantly loving and extends grace constantly. And he's not going to give more grace for Manny and lesser grace to me or vice versa just because. You know, the, the older son, I believe many people can relate because the older son was still living with his father, but he failed to recognize, 
He failed to appreciate and recognize that everything the father had was his. So a lot of people, maybe they know Christ, maybe they're believers, but they're not aware of their position as a child of God. They're not aware that they are living in the kingdom of God. So because they're not aware, they, they, they miss it. They, they, they go hungry. They feel like they're in lack because they don't know that everything they need has already been for, provided for by God the Father. Everything they need was already provided for on the cross. Grace is already there. It's there. It's available. They don't have to be in lack, but they, they're living in lack because they're not aware that it's there. And that's what the father was trying to say to the older son. He said, you know what? You've been living here with me. Everything I have is yours. So my grace is here for you already. It's just that you fail to recognize it. So it's not that the father wasn't giving it. It's just that the son failed to recognize it. And, you know, the story is so beautiful because it shows that, you know, no matter what we are like, mm. even if we, we do the wrong thing, even if we mess up, God's grace is always there. And the reason that God's grace is there is because he's a father. And if we are his children, so his grace is already there. It's already available, but we are the ones who miss it. We are the ones who need to realize the heart of the Father and really come back to Him and understand everything He's given us by His grace. So, how God sees us in Second Peter chapter three verse nine. How God sees uh, people who are unrepentant, who are rebellious. Let's look at this. Second Peter three nine. The Lord is not slow about His promise. The promise that He was referring to here is the promise of Jesus coming back. So that he will rule the world and he will judge the righteous and the unrighteous. So that, that's a that's the point. God is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness. People are, are saying, Lord, how come you're 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 delaying, delaying, delaying? The world is getting worse and worse. People are getting more corrupt. When are you gonna judge them? But you know what God is saying? But is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish. This is the will of God. I want you to know that the will of God is not wanting for anyone to perish. And again, perish means destruction. Perish means uh, perish means brokenness. He doesn't want people to be broken. He doesn't want people to suffer. But for all to come to repentance, for them to have a change of mind, for they to for them to renew their mind, renew their mind to come back to God. And receive his grace. We have a loving father. I want you to know that God is not angry at you. God is not out to punish you, but he is waiting for you to come home. And the reason why you have experienced, many of you probably have experienced suffering. It is not that God is wanting you to experience it. You are suffering because of the wrong decisions that was made by your parents. Maybe because it is the wrong decision made by your neighbors or your relatives. Maybe you are affected by the wrong decision of your boss. We are surrounded with so many broken people. And you know what broken people do? They break others. Hurting people hurt people. And the reason why we experience brokenness is because of this. Number two, we live in a broken world. This world is really not going to last. It has to be renewed. It has to be, it has to be uh, redeemed. And time will come that Jesus will, will renew it all. Make all things Make new. Make all things new. There will be no more crying, no suffering, no pain. When Jesus comes back, that's why it's exciting. We are living in exciting times. Jesus is coming back very, very soon. But, you know, all this suffering is not from Jesus. So when sin entered the world, it really set to break everything. It really started to destroy everything. That's why even this world will wear out like a garment. This world will not last forever, but Jesus will come and make all things new. So he is not angry at you. He's not out to punish you, but he is waiting for you to come home. God is calling you home. God is calling you home. And God wants you to understand that if you have Jesus, if you believe in Jesus and confess that he is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that he died for your sins and completely paid for your sins, past, present, and future, that you are already his son. The Bible says you have not spirit, you have not received a spirit of slavery. The younger son was thinking, you know, I just, you know, consider me as a slave again. But the Bible is saying, you have not received a spirit of slavery, my son, leading to fear again. But you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. 
And Lisa, this is what she mentioned a while ago in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 to 14. For he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sin. And how good is God? Let me just show you verses upon verses to show that God is a good God. If you then being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask Him? All that God is giving us is good. He doesn't give us evil. If it is good, it is from God. If it is evil, it's from the devil. That's another topic that we can discuss. Romans 8, 15 to 16. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. You have a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father, and the Spirit himself testify with our spirit that we are children of God. He who did not spare his own son but delivered him over us all, how will he not also give us, freely give us? Did we have to afford it? Did we have to buy it? Is it transactional? Do, Do we have to earn it? It says here, freely give us all things. And then he mentioned in Romans chapter 8, I suggest you read Romans chapter 8. It's a good, good chapter. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, will distress, will persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? If you notice, Christ will not bring tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword to you. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, all these things comes because of the brokenness of the world, because of our wrong choices, because of the wrong choices of other people, or because of the attack of the enemy. But Christ is saying, you know what? Your love is secured in me. Mm -hmm. But in all these things, in fact, we can overwhelmingly overwhelmingly conquer. conquer. Not, Not just, you know, conquer a little bit. Because our expectation from God is just here. God is saying, you know what? You can overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. You know what? Love conquers all. That's what he's saying. Through love, cast out all fear. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things in the future. Anybody here is afraid of the future? The Bible says, you know what? The future can touch you principalities, powers, height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is Christ, in Christ Jesus our Lord. This verse is so amazing because it's saying in all these things, so it pretty much covered anything bad that could happen on this earth, anything, it's, it's covered, it's done. In all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. So I just want us to have an understanding that if you are a child of God, you are starting from the conquering position you you don't face life from the bottom you face life from the top from the conquering position so whatever is coming against you it's under because you are overwhelmingly conquer so that's your position your position in ch- in Christ as a child of God is from the top from the overwhelmingly conquer position so anything else that happens it's under here because of what Christ did for you so we don't have to live life feeling like we're under this we're under all these problems we're under the fear no We live life from the position of someone who overwhelmingly conquers because of what Christ did for us and because of our position as a child of the King. That's why we call this ministry live, live in victory, because that is what Jesus called us for, for victory. We have a good, loving father and the father, the father's will reflect who he is good, acceptable and perfect. I will just end with two verses. The first verse is in, uh, uh, or, or two passages. The first passage in First John chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. See how great love. I will repeat. See how great love. Many of us have not seen how great the Father's love has bestowed upon us. That we, we would be called the children of God. And such we are. I That's like a love letter for us. Like written with God's own hand, he's saying, see, my son, my daughter, see how much I love you and I have bestowed my love to you that I would call you my child and such you are. I just want you to to make this personal. For this reason, 
the world doesn't know you because it did not know Jesus. Beloved, you, you are my beloved. Now you are my child. And it has appeared yet what we will be. All that you have going through right now, this is not yet it. This is not yet. The best is yet to come, my child. The best is yet to come, my beloved daughter. You know that when Jesus appear, appears, my son, when he appears, you will be like Jesus. Because you will see him as he is. And everyone, including you, who has this fixed hope in my son Jesus, you purify yourself just as he is pure. So this is God's love language for us, God's love letter for us. And so how do we, how do we, how do we live in this world? In the midst of suffering, in the midst of trial, in the midst of uh, um, you know, things that are trying to break us. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is. His good, acceptable, and perfect will. You know, as far as God is concerned, God wants you to experience His good, acceptable, and perfect will. Shall we pray? Father God, we come before you and thank you for making us realize that you are a God who did not only extend us mercy, you did not give us what we have, what we deserve. You did not only extend us justice, but you have extended us your grace. Lord, grace is something that we don't deserve, but you have poured out your wrath on sin, on your son Jesus, so that we may be saved, so that we may be made whole, so that we may be healed, so that we may be delivered. Father, I pray that each, of, each one of us here will have an understanding how good and loving you are so that we can be rooted in our identity in Christ, that we will have that confidence to approach your throne, not because we deserve it, but because your son purchased it for us. And Father, for those people who have no relationship with you yet, I pray that you will open their hearts and minds for your word. And if you are that person right now, I know as you listen to this video, I want you to know that God is calling you home. And all you have to do to respond to his call is say, I believe that Jesus is my Lord. And I confess that God raised him from the dead. And so, Lord Jesus, since I believe and I confess that you are my Lord and Savior, I receive. I believe. I receive your grace. Come upon my heart. Change me from inside out. And I want to experience God the Father, the loving Father, not only in my life, but in my family and with my neighbors. This I pray in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for joining us today in Live. We pray that you are encouraged with what you learned from the Word of God. And we just want to encourage you more that whatever you did learn today, hold on to it. Plant it as a seed in your heart because we believe that the Word of God is true and it is powerful and it can change your life. Remember, in Jesus, we can live in victory. God bless you guys.